Thank you to our worship team, to Gideon, Kayla, Tim, and Lori. And of course, we have Nathan and Caleb. No, yeah, Nathan and Caleb in the back. Actually, Caleb and Nathan, the way I'm looking at them. I told them I'd promise them I'd get their names right this morning. I might not be able to fulfill that promise today. But I promise I will try. Good morning to everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Derek, and I'm the lead pastor here at Elmira Pentecostal Assembly. Just welcome to everyone for joining with us, whether you're here in person, uh, whether you're joining with us via live stream in the fellowship hall or live stream online. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, two things before we get into today. Uh, first of all, I want to say a, a very big thank you uh, to everyone who donated either to myself to Pastor Michaela or to Katie Sealing and her team from Elmira Pet Products. Uh, together, if I got all the numbers and calculated it right, we had 29 donors. That should have been easy math, but you never know. 29 donors who gave to the Woolwich Counseling Services through their Moveathon fundraiser. Uh, we weren't informed of a dollar amount, uh, but nevertheless, your support and your contribution uh, to our community is very much appreciated. Uh, Woolwich Counseling Services posted on their Instagram account said, thank you to all the congregation members at Elmira Pentecostal Assembly for your support of mental health in our community. So we got a shout out from one of our, uh, one of our local organizations. So thank you so much again to all of you for that. Uh, secondly, as many of you know, 2022 marks the 101st anniversary of our congregation, which is a very long time, beautiful time. Uh, we are planning on some anniversary celebrations wi which will take place this September. Uh, I know I said August at the start, but we have pushed that back a little bit. Um, but I'm asking for a little bit of a favor. Uh, we are looking for a few people who are interested in and talented at a little bit of, uh, I'm calling it research and writing. I know that's not, maybe not the most exciting thing, but some of you, that is exciting, and that's great. Uh, we have a little secret plan that we're putting together. Now, this is a top secret surprise for the congregation, so for those of you who, are, uh, who would like to volunteer for this, you've got to you know, keep your mouth shut about it. Is that okay? Can we do that? It's a secret. You've got to keep it a secret, right? Anyway, it won't involve too much. It'll be a few nights, maybe a little bit of take-home work as well. Um, I can't promise that it won't be very much, but I, it's not going to be that much. Uh, and I don't think it'll be all that difficult. So if that interests you, please get a hold of me. You can uh, just talk to me after service or talk to me through the week. Uh, email me, Pastor Derek at AlmiraAssembly.com. I'd love to hear from you. All right. You ready? Imagine a life where you have absolutely no work to do. There's absolutely no agenda each and every day. You get to wear a white robe all the time. You can ride around on clouds and angels are playing harps. I don't know what they actually sound like. And all we do is sing worship songs every day, all day, every day, forever and ever and ever. Now, all of you are thinking, I'm going to put these words in your mouth because I know you're thinking it. All of you are thinking some of that sounds a little weird. You can say it. It's okay. And some of you are even thinking, I don't know if that's all that enjoyable. Worship songs for that long? Forever's a long time. And some of you are feeling bad because you're like, am I supposed to be excited about that? But I'm not. Well, don't worry. Because, here's the thing, everything that I just described, there's not a lot of biblical evidence to tell us that that's what heaven is like. And everyone went, huh, really? Not a shred. Not much at all, actually. There are a lot of misconceptions based on, I guess, popular mythology, uh, the proliferation of uninformed media outlets, as well as just plain ignorance, not like rude ignorance, but the actual we just don't know. Belinda Carlisle wrote in her song, They say he in heaven love comes first. We'll make heaven a place on earth. Ooh, heaven is a place on earth. I had to add the ooh. Robert Plant, yes, I know what band he's from, wrote this. There's a lady who's sure all that glitters is gold. And she's buying... I can't sing that up here, can I? No. And she's buying a stairway to heaven. And Jim Gaffigan once joked, am I the only one that finds it odd that heaven has gates? What kind of neighborhood is heaven in? 
What, when you die, you get to go to a gated community? Are the gates really necessary? Who are we trying to keep out? We're going to look at a number of different texts this morning, today, to help us grasp a better and maybe a fuller understanding of what heaven is all about, what it's like, where it is, all of that stuff. The word heaven, or heavenly, or heavens, appears in the Bible 734 times, spread out throughout almost all the books. 737 times if you include the word paradise. Now the word heaven in Hebrew is pronounced, you ready for this? It's pronounced samayim, which is a lot of fun to say, by the way. Say it with me, samayim. The word heaven in Greek is pronounced uranos. Say it with me, uranos, which is not very fun to say. The word paradise in Greek is pronounced, ready for this, paradiso. Sounds like you're at Starbucks or something. But why, why do we even have a heaven? Like, like, what is the actual, where is heaven? What is heaven like? We're going to try to tackle all of these things today. Death in itself, obviously because, you know, to get to heaven you have to get there. Death in itself is a great mystery to this world. It's an inevitable event that all of us must go through. And, and yet I think all of us, we have that little bit of, little bit of fear about getting there. But death is not, nor was it ever meant to be, a punishment to the Christian for their sin, but is a natural result of living in a fallen world. Christians and non-believers all experience the same events throughout our lives. We experience aging, we experience illness, rather, natural disasters, and yes, eventually we all experience death. On occasion, yes, God intervenes and reverses those effects, but only for a time. Death, however even if delayed through the miraculous, will still come to all of us. Wayne Grudem sums it up this way. We still live in a fallen world, and our experience of salvation is still incomplete. So though our salvation is part of our lived experience now, you know, we can all say, oh, we're saved, I'm saved. Our salvation as followers of Jesus comes to its climax, if you will, uh, when we arrive in heaven or paradise in the last days. So heaven is first and foremost a resting place or a place of rest. When a believer dies, just like we say at every funeral, they go to be with Christ. But this isn't quite heaven quite as we think of it, as the final destination or as our eternal reward, but as a time to wait until the final resurrection of the body into a renewed and rejoined heaven and earth. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 16 to 21, he says this, For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and are still in your sins. Then those who also have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For, by a, for as by a man death came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. My own emphasis added in those. There's always existed this understanding of a final resurrection throughout Judaism and which passed on through the teachings of Jesus, and we talked about that last week. But there's obviously this gap, I guess we'll call it, in understanding what it is when, when people die but have not been yet resurrected. So there's a term often used in the New Testament, people will say that people have fallen asleep. It's not always the case, by the way, when you read the word, you have to use a little wisdom when reading it. Uh, but however, there is certainly the case here in 1 Corinthians when Paul is writing it. Sleep is a common metaphor in the New Testament which refers to death. Most often when, a, when discussion about the final resurrection is in the discussion. So are those who have passed away, are they with Jesus? Are they in heaven? Are they just lying in wait? The answer is yes, all of the above. We can have hope that those who put their faith in Jesus and have passed away, have fallen asleep, if you will, are with the Lord. Though not in quite possession yet of their final reward, but it's coming. Now this is a touchy subject for me right now. I wrote this before 
the events of last night. It's like watching the final game of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Shut it. It's game seven or whatever game it is, and the clock ticks down and ticks down, three, two, one, zero, and the team has won. The players pour out onto the ice, and we say, what do we say? They've won the Stanley Cup, right? There's celebrations, there's photos, there's a presentation of the Conn Smythe Trophy, which like nobody really cares about, but everybody does at the same time. The team has won the cup, but yet they haven't got the cup yet. There's still some time in between. There's a time when we go to be with Jesus. That's our reward, just not in its fullness just yet. And those who lost, we've got to cover this topic too. Well, those who lost aren't really waiting for anything. They've lost. And as Jesus said in Matthew 25, 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So though our body dies and our body goes into the ground, our soul and our spirit lives on, awaiting to be reunited with that body in resurrection. Sam Storms wrote in his commentary on 1 Peter, he said, the terms flesh and spirit, or body and spirit, do not refer to the two elements of which we are composed as if to suggest that the former dies and the latter survives. Such Greek categories of thought are foreign to the New Testament. Flesh or body and spirit are not two separate entities of a human being, but, much, but a, more, a better way to look at it is almost like two sides of the same coin. Both are together. It, it's two, I don't know how to even describe it, because we get so caught up in our empirical way of thinking that we have to see one or the other, but it's as two states of being, if you will, that are joined together. So, if in our death we've simply gone to a resting place to be with the Lord, what about all this talk about the renewal of creation? You kind of banged on this a lot last week. And we've heard about Jesus coming back someday, and if we're waiting for it, what will we be waiting for? So I've kind of entitled this, I'm sticking with some R's, and I tread this very lightly. Return, rapture, and return. Now, some of you hear the word rapture, and, ha and I pretty much split the room in half, and this is how it goes, okay? You ready? Lord, help me for saying this. As soon as you say rapture, half the church goes, yeah, finally, the pastor's preaching on the end times. And then the other half of the church goes, oh, the pastor's talking about the end times. So you don't have to admit which category you're in. That's fine. But we've all seen the signs on the road. Are you ready for Jesus' return? I saw it on a Corolla just yesterday. No one is denying, though, the return of Jesus Christ to earth. But what is that all about? I will both confess and inform you that the waters on this subject are a little murky. And anyone who thinks that they have all of this completely figured out, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to call it out, you're a little out to lunch. Because we don't really get a full grasp on this. But let's read about it, where we come to this conclusion. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18 says this, Paul writing to the Thessalonians. He says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. There's that word again. That you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds. There's that word again, too. To meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. So first off, the word rapture, you know how many times it's found in the Bible? Zero times. It's not found. It's a word that we've constructed up. But the rapture as we think about it is not so much about whisking us away to abandon the earth forever. The rapture is a belief that those who are left living when Jesus does return are brought to the same place all the people before them have gone. The Greek word translated to meet, as in to meet the Lord in the air that Paul writes, is the Greek word apentasin, and is found three times in the New Testament. 
this is the first. Uh, the se- sorry, this is the third. The first one is in Matthew 25, 6. It's a parable that Jesus says and he, where he talks about a parable when the virgin women go out to meet the bridegroom only to return to the wedding feast. And then again in Acts 28, where Christians in Rome go out to meet Paul at the form of Appius, only to turn back again and go into Rome. So built into this is this understanding of going out to meet, but then returning back to the place that you came from with the one you came to meet. So as we dig into what this looks like, and popular culture hasn't done us a lot of favors on this, we must all keep a level of humility in mind as we await for the hope of Jesus' return. N.T. Wright often calls this life after, life after death. Because our hope is that when we die, yes, we live in a spiritual state for a time in heaven, but our ultimate hope is that our soul is reunited with our bodies in resurrection, where we live on forever, guess what, on this earth. A renewed earth, by the way. A renewed earth the way that God intended it to be. It won't be like, like it is now. But this is our eternal home. Not a disembodied state in some other dimension or whatever we want to look at it, but here with these bodies renewed along with the rest of creation. Michael Whitmer wrote, We need not feel guilty for feeling at home in this world, for this planet is precisely where God wants us to be. And guess what? There's going to be things to do. Just like Adam was given a job of maintaining the earth, having dominion over the earth, naming all the animals, so will we. Paul finishes off this section with encourage one another with these words. We can't get up or caught up and too concerned with trying to figure out exactly when Jesus is coming back. We will know the times, we will know the seasons, as he says, but we don't know the exact timing. He told his disciples that even he doesn't even know. Let's never get caught up in thinking that we're smarter than Jesus. So our plan of attack is very simple. You ready? Be ready. Be ready. As the Bible says, now is the day of salvation. Don't be like the person who looks in the mirror and walks away, but the one who looks and does something about it. Be ready. Because it could happen at any moment. So going to meet or apentasis Jesus in the clouds to then return to earth, not the earth as we typically know it, not the earth as it stands today, not the earth that is marred by sin and death, but earth as it should be creation as it should be, as God intended, as it was back in the Garden of Eden. So we're now talking about, because we've got to stick with ours, Earth's renewal. Luke 23, 43, Jesus turns to the thief being crucified beside him. He says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Paradise is often a word associated in meaning garden. Why is Jesus telling someone that they'll be with him in a garden? The obvious is that it's a reference to the Garden of Eden, the world where sin is no longer present, where the relationships between God and man is perfected, where people's relationships with each other are pure, and the earth is no longer cursed with thorns and thistles and anything that makes it difficult to survive. So heaven is a place, first and foremost, where all things are new. Not replaced, new. Revelation 21, 1 to 2, John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. There's this line we say in wedding ceremonies when a man and a woman, to the exclusion of all others, the two join, are joined and the two become one. John very deliberately uses this analogy to tell us that these two spaces, if you will, heaven and earth, are joined together. There is no longer a distance, whether physical, whether philosophical, between the two. The two are one. Heaven is earth. Earth is heaven. And everything that exists on it is renewed. And this is the resurrection. This is the resurrection that we look forward to. The other thing the Bible says is there will be no tears or pain. Revelation 21, 4, just after this, says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, 
for the former things have passed away. The relationships with human beings will be completely restored because sin is no longer present to mess things up. People no longer be selfish or greedy, self-serving. People will value others as God's image bearers like they're supposed to. And we will all live in submission, ultimate submission to God's authority. Thirdly, heaven and earth will be at perfect peace. Isaiah 65, 25 writes, The wolf and the lamb shall graze together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in my holy mountain, says the Lord. Now some have used this to argue that animals are in heaven. I generally don't argue with that. The answer is kind of like whatever. But the purpose of this is that everyone who we think should be enemies with others, be based on whatever differences we may have, our differences will no longer be what splits us apart, but will actually be set aside for us to live together in perfect peace. Our personal and physical characteristics are not lost in heaven. Our identities are even maintained. I will know you. You will know me. We'll get to know other people. And I remember a prof said this to me one time. Actually, well, he didn't say it to me. He said it to the class. But we were talking about, you know, perfected bodies and what does that look like? What does that look like? And people were saying things like, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll no longer have any blemishes. Like, my skin will be perfect and hair will be nice and whatever else. And he took him to us and he said, you guys know that Jesus still had holes in his hands, right? Yeah, he did. I tend to think that we will carry some of the scars over. I'm not really sure about that. But we'll carry some of the scars over, the, deter the determining characteristics of who we are. We'll carry on. Perfected, yes. New bodies, yes. The characteristics, still there. But there's even this callback, even in this part, Call back to Genesis 3. After the original sin, God declares that the evil serpent, or sorry, to the evil serpent and says, on your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And just like Isaiah says, the dust shall be the serpent's food. God's plan at this point is making a statement that God's plan will have succeeded. Evil will be done away with, subdued once and for all, because when evil is eradicated, that is when perfect peace can and will exist. And lastly this, in heaven we will be in possessions of houses and fruitful gardens. I just took the lines out of the text. As part of a longer discourse on the new heaven and new earth, Isaiah says it in 65, Isaiah 65, 21, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. What it means is that the work you do, because you will have work to do, you will get to reap the full benefits of. There's nothing that will impede you. There is nothing stopping you. There will be nothing to destroy it, no one to take it from you. What you build, you will possess. What you reap, you will sow. No longer affected by a fallen creation. So there's certainly nothing for us to do in heaven. Sorry, there's certainly not nothing for us to do in heaven. But I'm going to end with this. I'm going to call the band back up. If God has put us here, then it only stands to reason that our purpose in life intimately involves him. Athanasius said this, for of what use is existence to the creature if it cannot know its maker? In Philippians 3, Paul writes this, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Even heaven comes second to the surpassing worth of knowing our Savior, Jesus Christ. Because everyone wants to go to heaven but not a lot of people want to, want to come to Jesus. 
And if the only reason you want to know Jesus is so that you can go to heaven, I might argue that we're treating our salvation as a bit of an idol. The cross becomes an idol. The resurrection becomes in some ways a magic spell. And heaven's somehow a possession that you, we think we deserve. Heaven is great, but heaven can only become a reality when we know Jesus. Because you're going to spend eternity with Jesus. So you better know him. And you better like him a lot. And my prayer for all of us is that we come to know, that we come to love, we come desiring to submit to and to serve Jesus with our whole hearts every part of our being, all day, every day, yes, forever and ever. And serving Jesus without worrying about what others think, without worrying about what others say, without being distracted by what we're told is important in this life, without regard even for our own lives, because nothing, nothing Nothing compares to the worth of knowing Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Yes, heaven is a reward, but nothing compares to the worth of knowing Jesus. I invite you to stand with me now as we sing. We sing about our Savior how forever he is lifted high. He is at the right hand of his Father, interceding on our behalf. And he is calling us to his side. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon him. The ground began to shake, the stone was rolled away, his perfect love cannot be owned. Now death, what is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered in defeat. And now forever He is glorified. Forever He is lifted high. Forever He is raised. He is alive. He is alive. One final breath he gave. As heaven looked away, the Son of God was laid in darkness. A battle in the grave. The war on death was waged. The power of hell forever broken. The ground began to shake. The stone was rolled away. His perfect love could not be overcome. Now death is your sting. Our resurrected King has rendered in defeat. Forever he is glorified, forever he is lifted high, forever he is risen, he is alive, he is alive. Say hallelujah, we say hallelujah, we say hallelujah, the lamb is overcome, 
We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. Let us overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. Let us overcome. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah. Now forever he is glorified. Forever he is lifted. pray that each and every one of us would stand amazed in your glory, stand amazed by who you are. And would recognize that surpassing worth of simply knowing you. And God, we would surrender our whole lives over to you and your purposes for us and declare you as our resurrected Savior now and forever and that everywhere we go that Lord our lives would reflect who you are that God we could share about the hope of Jesus to our neighbors our friends person across the table to the person across the counter at a store the Lord we would reflect your love to them and Jesus I pray for your spirit to move in our hearts each and every week and that we would seize every opportunity that we have that's presented to us to share the good news of Jesus with someone Lord, we thank you for your promises to us, both now and for the future. That, God, we know that we get to go be with our Lord. That we get to be in a renewed heaven and earth with you forever. So thank you for that promise. I pray that we would hold on to that each and every day and share that with someone. So God, I pray that you'd be with us this week as we go and do whatever it is what we do, whether it's work or whether it's going to the grocery store or the gas station, just meeting people on the street, meeting people across the fence in our backyards. Lord, bring one person into our path this week that we can share the good news of Jesus with and the hope of glory with. Use us in those moments, Lord. Be with us as we go. We ask this all in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said. just have a seat just for a moment. We have a, uh, I guess a small, I guess it would be a small announcement, I guess the way I'll put it. Sorry, worship team, I did not tell you about this. Um, on Sunday, May the 29th, so that is two, two, two weeks from today? Two weeks from today. Um, following the service, we are uh, calling a, a, I guess a special meeting for all the membership at Elmira Pentecostal Assembly. Um, Anyone who attends EPA is also welcome to join us as well. Um, 
The purpose of this meeting, if you will, is to present, uh, to discuss, and uh, to vote on uh, moving forward uh, with a little bit of a building project we have going on here. Uh, the board has been working very hard over the last, I know, it's been quite a few months actually, uh, with Fry Brothers Construction to create plans. Uh, and our plan is to build an elevator in the building uh, that will make our building 100% completely accessible. And so this is obviously a large undertaking. It's a fairly large expense. You don't get, well, you don't get uh, elevators on Amazon, just in case you're wondering. And so, uh, so this, this, because it's a big expense, it's a big undertaking, it does require membership approval for this. So um, uh, we're hoping you will join us for that. Again, that's Sunday, May the 29th, following the service. Uh, lunch will be provided as well. And so we are hoping also at that time that we may present uh, some renovation plans for the sanctuary as well at that time. Uh, so that both of these projects, and I mean both, and I'll emphasize again, both projects uh, can move forward. And so um, they're both in the works, and because obviously the size of them, we want the church to hear about it as well, and obviously to talk about the, the, the we've called it the lift project in the past, it's, I'm calling it the elevator project, whatever it is, it goes up and down. Good with that? All right, will you stand with me? If you have any questions, by the way, feel free to email or call the church. We'd be happy to discuss any of it with you. If you just have any questions, let's chat. So now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we can ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Have a great week, everyone. We'll see you back here next Sunday. God bless you. A, remind, a last minute reminder of the first impressions meeting. Meet in the fellowship hall in like 10, 15 minutes or so. See you there. God bless you.